Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining. Sorry, we're a couple of minutes late, um, but I have got three very esteemed uh, speakers with me today. Um, we want to talk about how operators can work together for the greater good of the industry um, and how, you know, the, the balance between is it so fragmented it needs regulators to, to lay down the law or can operators do a lot more? And what does the future hold for betting in Europe? Uh, I'm Keith O'Loughlin. I'm the SVP for Sportsbook for Scientific Games. Um, and the focus today is on interactivity, cooperation between operators, and how, you know, as an industry, we can um, get through the realities and the difficulties of the last nine months of COVID. I don't want to dwell too much on that, but just look at in an increasingly regulated market and what the next five to 10 years look like. So um, I want to welcome you all today. And uh, I want to introduce the uh, panelists. So first off, um, I'm just going to do a brief intro and then let people introduce themselves. So first off, I've got uh, yes for yes for Spencer and um, CEO of Betson. Yes, for just give us a little intro, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good to good to be here today. So I'm the CEO of um, Betson Group, and uh, I'm today calling in from Malta, where we have our headquarters. Looking forward to some some good discussions here. Thanks, Jesper. And I've got Alexis Murphy from Betfirst Group joining us from Belgium. Alexis, just give us a little intro. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, delighted to, to be here. Um, uh, as Keith said, I'm calling in from uh, Brussels. Uh, I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Betfirst. We're the uh, uh, leading Belgian-owned uh, sports uh, betting operator uh, uh, here in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and um, yeah, we're owned by a, a media company um, and uh, have been operating uh, here for just over 10 years. Brilliant. Thanks, Alex. I've also got uh, Niels Eric Froman, who's the CEO of Dansk Spiel, and joining us from Denmark. Niels, you're very welcome. Just give us a couple of minutes. Here. Yes, thank you, Keith. Um, it's Nils here from uh, Danske Spill in Copenhagen. Uh, I have a CEO of the regulated part of our market. We also have the lotteries, but uh, I'm focusing on the regulated part. And I've been here for a number of years. Um, we are looking into, um, you could say, a, a very exciting environment these days. And therefore, I'm very happy to be able to maybe share some thoughts and ideas uh, for the next uh, uh, half hour or so. So thank you for for giving me the opportunity to join this wonderful panel. Thanks, Niels. So without further ado, uh, I'll kick into a first question. And, and yes, for if, uh, if I can give this one to you. So what contingency planning have you as a business been able to put in place over uh, the summer as COVID cases are now about to spike again? And you know, there's, there's a gray cloud looming over every, uh, every country in Europe that feels inevitable that the mm -hmm. lockdown is be uh, very tight over the next three to six months. So, how have you been able to plan ahead for that? Yes, but please. Well, I, I, I think uh, only from 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 the business uh, point of view, quite immediately we started to work remotely, and uh, and we have really put focus on security for, for the whole organization in, in in focus here. And we are still we are still working remotely. So. Uh, I mean, from February until now, uh, very few people have been have been in the in the office, and um, it's. I, I mean, it's working surprisingly well. If you would have asked me a year ago, I I would have not think that uh, that that would have been possible. So I think we have mitigated a lot on the security side for our employees in a time in in a time that is very very challenging. But I, I also think it's important to say that we are, we are incredibly fortunate, in particular, I would say a company like Betson Group, that is mainly a digital business. And uh, what we have seen during this time from pure business, business that digitalization has increased and, um, and uh, we are in the forefront of that, uh, of, of digitalization. So, 
our business is doing well in 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 a time where there is a lot of suffering glo globally and many businesses are striving to survive and um, we are doing really well and uh, th that I think you were very fortunate to be able to say in 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 a time like this. So that also gives a lot of security to to anyone that works in the company. We are actively recruiting uh, in more people, expanding to more markets, and 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 so forth. So uh, only from from that point of view, there is uh, there is definitely uh, also positives to mention in relation to this. Great. Um, Alexis, let me same question to you. What how have you been able to plan um, your contingency and, and how has your business adapted uh, over the last nine months? Yes, so uh, I mean, I'd echo uh, many of uh, Jasper's uh, sentiments. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, adapting to uh, remote working, um, you know, we've, we've been doing it for, for quite a while uh, now. So it, it just feels uh, probably more like more of the, the, the same. Um, you know, you, we've, we've uh, adapted our, our tools, our ways of working uh, and, and changed quite a lot of things uh, internally. So uh, it's more, I think, a process of uh, refinement uh, there. Uh, I think, um, you know, even though there's uh, perhaps a, a degree of inevitability about the, the sort of the, this uh, second wave that's uh, coming, it's obviously uh, regrettable, and uh, one area of, of focus needs to be on on people's uh, psychological uh, well-being. Because even though you know the tools and processes uh, may work uh, for people in a wide variety of different circumstances, it presents uh, different challenges. So that's something that uh, we're, we're spending uh, quite a bit of time with our staff focusing on. Uh, uh, making sure that people, um, you know, are staying uh, sane and have the the, the right psychological uh, mindset. Um, you know, again, our our, our business uh, has been uh, very uh, resilient in the face of this crisis. Uh, we we do uh, count ourselves very fortunate as a, a sector. Um, we're somewhat different to to, to Betson in so much that we uh, have. Uh, uh, a not insubstantial um, uh, retail business uh, as well. Uh, during the initial COVID crisis, that was it was essentially shut down uh, for for a period of two months. So uh, that required quite a bit of adaptation. Um, and notwithstanding the, the kind of new restrictions that we're facing in Belgium, I don't think we're going to be facing that situation again. Um, in large part because uh, we're. we're not really in the betting shop market, but we operate uh, via news agents, uh, and news agents are deemed, uh, deemed uh, an essential service, and uh, so on. So, I think we'll have less challenges uh, uh, there. Um, and uh, otherwise, I think it's uh, notwithstanding the, 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 the general uh, environment, it's, up, it's about keeping uh, upbeat and uh, positive uh, about the future and, and actually looking at the opportunities uh, arising from this challenge. You know, one small uh, example being uh, the uh, continued growth of, of esports. Uh, we saw a huge uh, increase in interest uh, during the first uh, COVID wave now, largely because. Uh, there had been a, a diminution in, uh, in other sports, uh, but we've still seen that growth really, uh, step up. So uh, it's pushed us, it's given us new impetus to, to really focus uh, on areas uh, such as esports and uh, innovating to find uh, new ways of, uh, of entertaining people at home. Uh, I think that's, uh, you've hit on kind of two of the key areas. One is on innovating to find new areas of product, and two is on uh, the well-being and, and mental health of people, because technology, I think, in the main, I think most businesses I see technology has performed well, and the switch in terms of business being able to adapt, but, but a lot of the burden of that is on is on people. And um, Neil, from your perspective, how have you been able to uh, plan over the change of business and plan for what's an inevitable second wave? Yeah, I agree with much of what you said, Alexis, is basically that the second wave is also a psychological game because uh, obviously we came through with our digitalization, including the digital 
digitalization we've done in our shops uh, quite well and we have seen a little movement from from the retailers into the uh, to the to our app sales and of course that's the way it's going to go but i think uh, this is not just about the the total omni channel feeling but also how we 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 need to be I know it's it sounds obvious, but more agile and and even more short sighted because we have to cut our projects into smaller pieces, and make sure that uh, once we get them, uh, once we get them done, that we can react to the 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 data we have and uh, and and kind of reorganize if we need to, and I think that's an aspect that actually goes for the whole Danish society is that. It's difficult to look 12 months or six months ahead. So we work the, the, the same way as the rest of our society. And that is uh, uh, for the next 30 days or two months or so that we will line things up and make sure that we collect all the data we can and, re and respond on that. Of course, we are, uh, uh, you could see, influenced by the number of markets, especially in our sports book, going down. Uh, and I think that goes for all of us. And of course, we are very concerned about uh, when the big sports events are being moved or cancelled and of course we cross our fingers that uh, all the big leaks and stuff that we're actually depending on for the turnover will get through this second wave as uh, safely as possible so i would say that this is much about being prepared and take the best practice that we had from the first wave in terms of how our organization is reacting to all the numbers or the big number of projects that we are running and then react very agile and and flexibly with full flexibility when we have the data from what we're doing and that goes both in our go-to-market strategies and uh, when we monitor sales and of course our technical platforms as well that's very interesting. Thanks, Niels. Um, I, I think I'll stay with you for a second, Niels. Is in, in terms of your view on the industry and uh, how do you think the industry has responded? And and are we? You know, I think what you've said is across the board, um, people have innovated, uh, brought new product through. Technology yeah. platforms have done well, and they've, they've all stood up. And people have been able to um, to really pivot forward towards the customer. But how, how do you feel the industry is, is dealing with and, and has dealt with it? And how do you feel the industry uh, is taking care of its people? Because the, the big switch is, is on a human level. I, I think that uh, we do all our best and we try to find out how can we actually uh, find as an organization new ways of working, but also at the same time to make sure that our uh, customers feel that we are synchronized with their needs. We have seen that uh, any rollout of uh, loyalty schemes with uh, a focus on a higher share of time and not just share wallet has been received uh, quite well. Uh, and and we have to do that because, uh, as I said, things are changing. We have a, a very keen eye as well on on a number of um, projects that might have been postponed until 2021 that we will take into 2020 to make sure that we have everybody, uh, all staff available for as long as possible. And we haven't seen layoffs like in many other sectors in Denmark, because, of course, we believe that on the other side of this, that the digitalization will do good for us. And the second thing is that we will need the best skilled people on the other side of the second wave as well. So we are actually doing all we can to make sure that we keep uh, our organization intact and that we are able to come up with the uh, products and services that will benefit the loyalty to our brands uh, in the long perspective as well. Sorry, Keith, uh, I'm not getting any Could audio there. Oh. Sorry. Are you okay? Sorry, yes, sir. Thanks, Neil. Thanks. Um, really insightful. Yes, sir, from, from your side, um, how do you feel the industry has responded? Could it have done more or, uh, you know, can it do more in the future? And how, as an industry, can we really support the people? Because the people is in the, that we all work with are the lifeblood of what we do. Mm -hmm. I, I think to the question, can can we do more? That you you can. It's only one answer to that. You can always do do more if you look at it. But I, I also think we um, uh, we have done we have done. It. And uh, I mean, in in going back to my my previous points, I think today, if we just look at the people who works within the gaming industry, 
compared to many other industries uh, for for the ones who works on the online side that has been um, you know a different reality to the people who are working on on the offline off, offline side in 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 that sense and i think as a company you have a certain responsibility to make sure that you take care of the people that work work for you and also as 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 a government you you have the same responsibility and and there has to be a dialogue between the two of them in order to to do this in the best the best way 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 possible i i think i i can only really speak for the for the online online part which i'm fortunate to be uh, much more involved in than the offline part and and here uh, here as i said before we have even increased uh, in, in, increased our business during this time and and we, we are recruiting a lot a lot of people in 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 this period i also think we, we also need to remember that in in a time when people are more restricted in the daily life and can't do what they were used to do in regards to travel going out to restaurants and so forth there, there, there is there is a, a lot of people that actually do have more disposable income today and they crave uh, online entertainment and that is uh, that is what what we we are giving to 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 our customers i think we have uh, increased responsibility to do this in the most responsible way really focusing on everything in regards to to responsible gaming so so uh, uh, we acknowledge that there is a different situation today than what it was just before uh, but uh, but but again i think uh, we we are here to provide uh, entertainment in a very very challenging time, but uh, as an industry, we really have to do it in in the most responsible way possible. I couldn't agree more. I think um, the burden is uh, fairly across all of our shoulders to make sure that we're um, giving great entertainment, which is what we've, which is what our, our role is to do, um, but also protecting players and protecting the people who, who we all work with. Alexis, from your perspective, um, just anything, how do you feel the industry has responded and, and what more could and should we do? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'll be honest, I think, um, I mean, the, the industry response uh, here in, in Belgium initially was uh, defensive, uh, specifically around the, the, the retail uh, uh, reaction and the measures being imposed on retail. So that's, that's sort of uh, quite natural. Um, but I think beyond that, um, there's a few challenges. Uh, I mean, I think in, in pretty much every jurisdiction that uh, I've come across, you know, in terms of the industry working together, uh, it's always a, a very tricky challenge, uh, putting co competitors together, trying to get them to uh, adopt a, a common line. And I would say in these times of uh, remote working and so on, I think that's gotten somewhat more difficult because it's one thing remote working with uh, colleagues, staff, uh, employees and so on, uh, where there's you know a fairly clear and definable common objective. When you're sitting across the table uh, with a, a competitor, I think physically sitting across the table with them uh, to try and uh, reach a compromise position is, uh, is a lot easier than doing it uh, via conf call where people mightn't be switching on video and uh, so on. So I think there is a, a simple kind of practical uh, uh, issue uh, there. Uh, and to the extent that this lasts uh, much longer, I think it will need to be addressed. And, and along a similar vein, uh, I think probably uh, similar challenges around uh, dialogue with, with government and, uh, and regulators. Uh, I mean, we, we, we see it here specifically in, in Brussels, where you, you've obviously got, uh, you know, it's the heart of, of Europe, a lot of uh, general lobbying, uh, political advice, and all of all of those sort of face-to-face -face meetings, uh, formal, informal, uh, have pretty much disappeared. And I think that uh, creates a significant challenge in, in any form of uh, negotiation. And uh, so I, I think that's going to be a challenge for us in the, the industry, you know, trying to um, uh, engage properly with uh, regulators, with uh, policy uh, makers uh, in, in a virtual uh, world. Um, so. I think, you know, ultimately that's a challenge that will need to be addressed. And, and also, you know, you add to that uh, the fact that 
Uh, I mean, we're, we're never as a sector uh, top of the agenda in terms of uh, uh, legislation or uh, regulation, uh, or very rarely anyway. Uh, and I think with, with all of the uh, obvious uh, priorities that are being determined by, by COVID, uh, unfortunately, our, there's a risk that our sector uh, ends up uh, uh, further down the, the, the bottom of the pile in terms of uh, 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 legislation. So um, I, I think, you know, it is an area where operators uh, in general need to, to really be aware of the, the environment and, uh, and, and focus on. Yeah, I, I, uh, I fully agree. I, I certainly see the challenges of it's very hard to build relationships from, from nothing. If you talk about competitors, it's very hard to build just over a uh, small queen on your laptop. Correct. Um, Next, next question to, to move on. So I want to just talk about the future of retail. Um, and you know, yes, for your perspective from an online, Alexis, you've got you know retail through news agents, and, uh, and Neil, you've got a, a much bigger uh, retail network. And um, coming to you first, Neil, so what's your view as to what retail looks like in the future, and in some ways at the end of retail? Well, what we have seen over the past uh, decade or so is basically that the migration from retail to online has been uh, much slower than expected originally. And we see that uh, our network of dealers, which is uh, close to uh, 3,200, is actually a, a very efficient way of staying in close contact with our with our clients. And especially these these days, we do our utmost to make sure that the, 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 the different um, um, consumer experience uh, in in retail uh, com compared to online is intact and very good. That we see that the social element is very strong, and we see that uh, we have a stronger partnership, especially with the networks uh, in in retail, uh, making sure that we can actually offer uh, a very very good um, um, sports book uh, for them as well. Uh, obviously, we know that, uh, and Jesper, of course. Uh, knows more of that than anyone else is that it's it's with 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 a jurisdiction just in Denmark we are limited to uh, actually trying to to safe keep the distribution that we have uh, because we can't uh, scale it outside Denmark so what we do in terms of retail and what is going to make the, a difference as we move along is basically to identify the segments that take that social part of buying uh, their sports betting products and services uh, into a much closer cooperation instead of just, you could say, uh, being very uh, from the inside and out from our side and perspective and take a much stronger hold on what will actually develop the retail sector instead of just being a supplier. So I would say ensure that we take the best of our partnership ideas that we have online as well and put that into retail. And that's what I see we're benefiting from right now. We have recently introduced um, um, registration in, in retail as well. Uh, uh, like the rest of Scandinavia, and that has really given us a platform uh, to to make a good partnership with the retailers in terms of identification um, of problem gamblers, but also that we can actually uh, tailor made some of the uh, omni-channel offices, uh, sorry, services that we want to offer. So I see the future of retail here is to stay close with us in terms of how we develop uh, the particular. Uh, customer experience when you choose to go retail instead of uh, being online from your laptop or your phone. Brilliant. Um, uh, it's uh, it's very impressive in terms of how you guys are uh, really leaning into to retail and, and bring it on to, to the next uh, um, wave of innovation. Um, Jesper, I know you have an online business, but you know I know in some jurisdictions that you may be looking at in the future, retail may be a part of that. Um, but, but what's your view as to in the end game as to where retail uh, fits in the ecosystem with with online? Um, I, I mean, it will be very market by market dependent, of course, because there, there are local dynamics in in any market. But what uh, what I think will there will always be a connection between payments offline into to online businesses. I think that's. Uh, something that in particular happening a lot in 
in uh, let's call it emerging markets uh, around around the world. I mean, we uh, when we speak about in in this case, if um, uh, if we speak about the Denmark or Sweden or UK and so forth, I mean, there there is a very developed system. Everyone is having bank accounts and so forth. But if we look at some of the areas or countries or continents that are growing. As we speak, you look at Africa and Latin America and so forth. There, 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 there is uh, probably a stronger correlation between between uh, offline offline payments and and online uh, online businesses from from that point of view. So I think retail will will always have a very significant role within within gaming, and then it comes down to market character characteristics and 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 maturity uh, depending on how how strong that role will be yeah i think um uh, your uh, you've got a money it, it will be very market driven but and i think depending on the individual customers and regulation uh, will shape um, what it can be. I also think innovation plays a part as to, from an operator and an industry perspective, how we can see how to best give customers what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. Um, Alexis, uh, briefly from you, because we're, we're uh, pushing on time, what's your view as to where retail and uh, digital will, uh, will interact together and what the future of retail is? Yeah, I mean, in terms of retail generally, uh, I probably be a little bit more bearish than um, the, the other uh, panelists. I think, you know, what we're going through is really an inflection point in terms of people's retail habits and the, the high street. So uh, I think as certain uh, sectors and segments go out of business, that'll have ripple effects on, on other uh, businesses within the, the high street. But that's more of a, a kind of general view on, on retail. Uh, I think inevitably it's going to force retailers to, to reinvent themselves. Um, we see it, you know, very clearly. We've uh, over 600 points of sale in uh, in Belgium, primarily uh, news agents. Initially, they were able to do sports betting to diversify their revenues, and increasingly, those same news agents are looking to diversify uh, further. Uh, so, you know, a classic one would be uh, collection and uh, depositing of uh, internet packages, uh, and really reinventing their businesses to coexist uh, with the digital world. And that's what they're uh, doing with us as well in terms of our omni-channel uh, programs. So, um, you know, we're, we're very much seeing the same tendency as uh, I think uh, Niels uh, mentioned, you know, where uh, our, our franchisees, newspaper, uh, 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 news agent owners uh, are becoming advocates for our digital uh, business and uh, they get remunerated on that. And uh, it works it works for them, it works for us. So, um, so I think it, it will have a, a big change and the focus will be on, on, on reinventing business models in uh, in retail. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, cog I'm cognizant of time and um, probably got two more questions and then we'll take them from the floor. Um, so just to talk about regulation for a second. Niels, I'm going to come to you first. So there's regulation tightening across all markets uh, in Europe and, um, you know, and some... Uh, um, you know, Germany and and uh, Netherlands. I've got you know um, impending uh, regulation changes. Um, just give me a view as to the regulatory framework and how difficult that is versus innovation as to what you want to do and to really add sizzle to to what you want to give to to your customers. So just give me a view on that balance and and how you feel about it. Niels, view first, please. Yes, I think I think the the balance is actually okay, and I think it's in our favor. I know that there are uh, pros and cons in terms of uh, how you sh you should see the perspective of going to market. But what we see, and I would like to connect a little to what you said, Alexis, on uh, how the business model is changing. What we see right now is basically people moving out of the bigger cities into to to the more rural areas. And what we see is that we can actually redefine the shops and the retailers' importance in how they build their infrastructure and what's happening right there. And that's one thing that basically helps us. But when you, you look at it in terms of uh, regulation, where we on one side have uh, the EU regulation and on the other side have the local regulation, I think that at one point where we could actually 
work together as an industry is basically to make sure that we, uh, at, at any given opportunity, uh, put forward for the regulators all the data we have on how we will have a CSR-based uh, uh, market approach so that we don't get these very uh, specific limits. It could be on deposits that we've seen during the COVID crisis and other stuff that will be maybe, maybe not taken into a, a, an EU level, but at least will work on a national level. And I think it's very important that we actually, as an industry, help the regulators to understand uh, what is actually uh, ups and, and downs in terms of how you you, you balance this market. So I would say that uh, we are very confident as being a strong local player here. We are, we, we are not seeing that much EU uh, uh, regulation coming uh, upon us. So what our approach is going to be here is basically to take all the, the, the good colleagues we have in, in our market and make Make sure that it is and on a data-based platform tell them what we see will be a sound market as we move on. Brilliant. Was that the key uh, to your question? So, so yeah. Thanks, thanks Niels. Um, I, I think really, uh, really solid approach, and you know, I do think uh, it's that forward-thinking attitude of bringing regulators on that journey is, is really important. Yes, but from your side, how, how do you feel the balance in, in regulation and, and innovation? So I, I think um, in many markets, we, we really try to, to do, uh, just as, as, as Niels was saying, you know, trying to work with the regulator and, uh, and come up with giving data, giving more of a science-based science uh, approach but uh, unfortunately, there there are many markets where that doesn't uh, hasn't mattered. That's a problem, you know. And that is when 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 politics at times come comes in, and uh, it, there will be decisions that are not based on on the data that is available from the operators. And I think here again, they're they of course going into the very different conditions in the various markets across across Europe. But if you get our industry, it, it will always, you know, it, it has a sensitivity to it. And um, and from a political point of view, um, you, you may not always score most points by, by working with the industry. Uh, we, have seen, we have seen regulators going the other way around uh, under political pressure to, to really show, show the other side of the coin. And this is very uh, in particular for for all the responsible businesses out there because what we see as a general trend is that um, offshore is growing uh, so in the end of that uh, when that trend continues the the, the one who is losing and these are the responsible companies the regulators and and the players themselves so i think many regulators have not been able to to balance this in a very good way uh, they have simply not listened listen to the facts. We need to keep hammering this forward uh, in in a very very objective way by just showing. Look at the numbers. This is this is what they say. This is what we're saying, and so forth. And uh, and and try to push um, push uh, an agenda based based on that. Um, then, of course, there are many good things that are happening as well that can be applied across jurisdictions. I, 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 I can see benefits, uh, benefits with, uh, with with those things as well. But I think uh, we we have a challenge in this, uh, a political challenge more more than anything else, and uh, we just need to to keep coming together and together really strongly drive drive. A Commander to to protect our our business interests. Um, they are um, unfortunately for a company like like well for all of us on on the call today. There is a rapidly growing offshore market out there, and that is a very profitable place to be. And and also companies will always be where the players are. That as as simple as that. But uh, uh, the, the various states have a responsibility to make sure that the regulation caters for everyone within the regulation, 
in order to protect the, the consumers and the businesses and the people working for those businesses. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I think your your point about making sure that uh, regulators listen um, to to and see that you know, as you said, where, where there are players going to have uh, operators all trying to get them. It's like fishing, you know, everybody's fishing in the same pond, and and regulators uh, being overzealous are doing themselves oper the regulated operators and. The uh, players a real disservice. Uh, so uh, I agree. We all collectively need to keep hammering that point uh, constructively. And as Neil said, bring regulators on the journey. Alexis, just to to wrap that, uh, your your view on innovation and regulation and, and where that balances and how we can help to get it right. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure uh, between innovation and, and regulation. Uh, I, I don't think innovation is necessarily the, 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 the nut that needs to be cracked, even though um, you know clearly uh, there's a lot that can be done by way of uh, innovation, uh, specifically for responsible gaming, uh, the use of AI and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, I'd really echo what's what's already been said in terms of for me, the, 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 the big challenge is that it's, uh, well, it's a simple one and it's not, but it's about information and uh, trying to explain to, to regulators, to legislators, how the sector operates, uh, what the risks are of certain uh, measures, uh, trying to, to get facts uh, out there. And, um, and and also, you know, I think that that's where European cooperation and, and big operators uh, who are operating across multiple jurisdictions really have a duty to sort of say, you know, essentially the, the, the problem that you're looking to solve in uh, certainly within Europe from one jurisdiction to, to another is pretty much the same. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no point reinventing the wheel each time and, and trying to, to share best practices, what's worked and uh, and so on. So um, I think, you know, at, at the moment during the, the COVID crisis, we see the challenges in terms of uh, regulating uh, and uh, politicians coming up with measures when, when there's an information vacuum. Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's uh, not inappropriate to use that as an example, I think it's, it's exactly the same issue uh, in the, the betting and gaming industry. You know, people have a, an intuition, uh, an impression uh, about certain things uh, and they, they use a hammer to, uh, to, to crack a, a nut. And um, or whereas actually, you know, there's many more uh, effective approaches. So um, ultimately, I think it's it's really about just doing the the, the hard work, of sitting down, and and trying to inform legislators. Thanks, Alexis. So so um, just a, a last question for for each of you. We're just about uh, out of time. So um, I just want, want you to share an anecdote, something that you've seen that's positive, something that caught your eye, a new product, a new way of working, you know, could have been just anything at all that you, you feel has been a, a green shoot or a positive that uh, you've seen over the last six months or so. Uh, Neil, if I, if I come to you first, just as a, as a final note. Well, yes, uh, just one anecdote that some of the Danish uh, Super League football clubs have been able to come up with some very great Zoom events where they have been able to show the audience, the fans from, from their couches cheering, uh, where we as, as the commercial partners have had the opportunity to actually to develop new ways of, of feeling a community around these uh, big games. I think that has been wonderful. And I think this is uh, just to stress that everybody here in Denmark uh, is looking forward to getting back into to the stadiums, to the grounds, to see their favorite teams. But as we are waiting for that and for the w wave two to, to descend, we are just looking into some uh, digital solutions that actually bring a lot of energy uh, both to 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 the clubs but also to to the loyalty schemes that we are running so that's one great thing uh, but though uh, I, I i still have to say that i'm looking forward to going back to the grounds to see my favorite teams uh, I suspect uh, um, some of your favourite teams are looking forward to getting you back in the stadium too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jesper, from from your side, I I'm, I'm not sure. I, um, I want to highlight some specific in, innovation that has been happening, but I, I I rather would like to say, can you say really? I mean, we're so resilient. 
I think, uh, as, as an industry. And I think to bring out the positives uh, now when, when sports has returned, players has returned and they have returned in, 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 big, in big numbers. And I just think that it shows a lot about the products we offer overall. There is the demand for what we're doing for this type of entertainment. And uh, and uh, uh, I, I think innovation put aside, only if we look at our traditional offerings, uh, I, I think the, the time really shows that um, that uh, we, we are giving consumers a product that uh, that they are buying into. And I think that, to me, to some degree, is probably the biggest biggest uh, takeaway from. From from the last six months, um, I would say. Could, couldn't agree more. Love it, uh, Alexis. Uh, and you. Yeah, for for me, uh, I, I'd focus maybe not on a, an industry specific phenomenon, but uh, more just in, internal uh, ways of working. And uh, I, I think with remote working. Uh, We've sort of had to overcompensate in terms of uh, communication, in terms of uh, familiarizing ourselves with people's individual uh, issues. And I think in many ways, uh, even though we're still working remotely, it's brought people uh, together. Uh, you know, whether it's uh, the small moments, you know, on a, a conference call where uh, the kids come running in or the, or the dog or, or whatever, and it, you get to know people uh, better. And I think as we, we saw during the summer, then when people come together in the office, uh, the bonds are, are that little bit uh, closer. So, um, you know, I'd like to think the, the positive uh, side of this is that uh, it forces us as, a, as an employer, as, uh, as teams to, to focus more uh, on the human side of, uh, uh, of things uh, and, and ultimately to have, you know, a, a better, more vibrant uh, business with, uh, with more motivated uh, people in it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think just for, for me, I think my uh, real positive is the uh, resilience of the people across the industry. I think, uh, Jesper, you touched on the resilience of, you know, to see when games come back that our, uh, the, the business comes back from a, a player's perspective. But, but for, you know, over effectively five-day period uh, in February, uh, end of February, early March, most countries went into lockdown and business, you know, we all as businesses stayed open to make sure we were giving entertainment to our customers. And that's what people certainly needed during very difficult times. And I think it's the adaptability of the people across our industry as a whole and everybody on this call. I uh, I want to say thank you to you all and, and give everybody kudos because I'm very proud to be part of the industry and uh, to make sure that we've all done every single thing we could to give our end customers and players a great service. And that's all we have time for. Um, I hope everybody who's tuned in has got some uh, value from the session. Uh, it's been a privilege for me to host uh, Jesper and thank you. Alexis, uh, great to hear another Irish accent again and, and thank you. And Niels, uh, looking forward to seeing Copenhagen uh, sometime soon. Uh, thank you all for your insights. I hope everybody got something from it and have a great uh, rest of the conference. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Jens.